this evening's speaker is Dr. Tom Gardner, archaeologist extraordinaire and heritage management specialist, who's been running the Gerog Museum excavations at Achtercairn since 2020 in his own time. He has, I mean that as a volunteer, I'm not a criticism of his timeliness. He's excavated across Scotland, England, Cyprus, Greece, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia. Tom is a specialist in geoarchaeology, that's archaeological soil science for the uninitiated, and he works as an archaeologist for Historic Environment Scotland. And tonight, Tom is going to be reviewing the Gerloch Museum Roundhouse Dig that took place in October this year as part of the Highland Archaeology Festival. Tom's going to be talking about the Bronze and Iron Age roundhouse communities in Western Scotland, their relationship with the local environment, and also telling us what the team found at this year's dig. And the good news is you won't need your wellies. Over to you, Tom. Thank you so much, Karen. I appreciate that. I'll just quickly share my screen and then I'll get started. Um, so we'll see yourselves in a wee second. There we go. Fantastic. And um, thank you all so much for having me. It's so wonderful to see so many familiar faces now um, around, around the Zoom call. Um, my family have been coming up to Gearlock for a very long time. Um, and, you know, this excavation and, and as Karen has said, done in my own time um, is very much um, something that I wanted to do to kind of pay a bit back to an incredible community of people on the west coast of Scotland that have really taken in um, my family and, you know, friends and everybody up on the west coast for a long time. Um, so thank you to everybody for that. And um, hopefully this is a way in which we can kind of start to alleviate that, that, that imbalance of us just coming up and having our summer holidays there and not giving much back. Um, as Karen said, I'm going to talk about uh, the excavations that we ran this year um, at uh, the Aftercairn Roundhouse 10, which is just behind the museum. You can see it on the image in front of you, um, which is in fact a beautiful photo taken by, I think, John Hyam, who is present. Um, I've not presented him with the photograph, uh, but I have done verbally, so sorry about that, John. Um, it's a stunning photograph which shows the uh, roundhouse excavation in the foreground. You can see, if you can see my cursor, that big muddy hole, that's, that's my fault. Um, that's the roundhouse um, in the foreground with the excavation through it from this year, the back of the museum looking stunning as always, and then the view out down the loch to the Minch um, and Gearlock and Strath in the background. Um, I've entitled this talk Gluttons for Punishment, mostly as an homage to the fearless and stalwart and entirely too enthusiastic excavators we've had from our local community, um, who, while the weather was better this year than it was in the past, have been insatiable truly insatiable in their thirst for getting muddy and digging um, to the point when even people who feel like they can rough it like me have been failing to convince some of the stalwarts to get down the hill in the appalling weather for a cup of tea. Um, so here is to them um, and I will bring you some of them as we move through the presentation. Um, in this talk, I'm going to talk to you about the kind of anatomy of a roundhouse generally the kind of checklist of stuff that we expect from an Iron Age or late Bronze Age roundhouse. I'm going to then take you through how Roundhouse 10, our roundhouse, just behind the Gearlock and Museum that we've been digging for three years, that like Karen said, how that compares to what we expect generally from your classic roundhouse. We're going to go through the points of interest from the excavation. You know, what are the big finds um, from this year? Um, we're going to go through the kind of current interpretations where we stand and then we're going to go through next steps. Um, Karen has very kindly introduced me and said that I'll be talking about how the wider environment um, relates to kind of Bronze Age and Iron Age uh, activity on the West Coast. That the problem with doing things late notice is that you write a blurb for what the presentation will be a couple of weeks in advance and then you forget what that blurb is so you write a different presentation so i won't be talking about what karen said i will be talking about but i'm happy to answer questions on it afterwards and we can cover that in any more detail if we go on the wider kind of environmental picture the paleo kind of climatic picture we can do that um so um yeah as i said here are your gluttons for punishment. I'm going to try and play a little video here, a little embedded video. These rarely work, but this is just to give you an, an understanding of what those fantastic community archaeologists have been dealing with 
for the last three years. So hopefully you can see that. I'll play it just a couple of times so that you can um, hopefully catch up with it. But you can see here is our wonderful roundhouse, sloppy, met, uh, sloppy wet digging in the rain behind the Gaelock Museum. Um, this year in particular, we had an incredible group of community archaeologists. I've listed them here. Um, Karen actually didn't get in the trench at all. She found every excuse she possibly could to not get in the trench. Um, Katie Walker and Mary Davies are my incredible colleagues um, and archaeologists uh, who were helping facilitate. Um, and then is our list of fantastic excavators um, who stuck it out for six days this year. It was our longest excavation to date um, and had some poor weather, as you can see. Um, so. I'm, I'm just going to interrupt to say we forgot sure. to mention um, Teddy and Isla who also came and dug with us. Of course, Teddy and Ella. There were a number of fantastically skillful young community archaeologists, um, such a high number, and so blinding was their incredible prowess that I have forgotten some of their names. Um, but fantastic, and thank you so much to them um, for their hard work. Um, so, the anatomy of a roundhouse. Those of you who have excavated with me will understand quite a lot of this, because we talk about it a lot on site. Um, this is your classic, classic Scottish Iron Age roundhouse, okay? So classically, and this is what we'll measure our roundhouse against in terms of how good it is yeah, and how classic it is. So classically, a kind of Iron Age roundhouse should include a stone built wall, a floor or floor deposits, a roof supported by posts. This is when it's built, by the way, not when we find it in the, find it in the ground. A roof supported by posts, usually a timber roof. You can see the structure on this fantastic um, reconstruction uh, by the Whithorn Trust. Um, this photo is AOC Archaeology's um, on the right-hand side, showing you that timber uh, internal structure with the thatch showing on top of it. Um, a roundhouse classically would have a hearth in the middle of it. Um, it would have internal subdivisions. We think of a roundhouse, and this is a kind of Iron Age, you know, maybe eight to 500 BC through to 200 AD. Um, so about 2,000 years ago in general, um, we think about these houses as just a circular structure. They've got lots of evidence that they have internal subdivisions, so they've got small rooms within them, sleeping berths, and some of them is reasonable good evidence that they also have a second story for um, second floor for storage. Um, so they've got a roof, they've got a hearth that sits in the middle generally, and um, they've got these internal subdivisions, and then they've got a doorway. The doorway is classically in the southeast of the roundhouse, and again, this is your homogenized, generic, classic roundhouse. It's generally in the southeast to get the maximum uh, amount of kind of useful daylight coming through because they got no windows. So if you want any light in there, any natural light, it's got to come through the door. And you can see the door is usually higher than the, the roof pitch at the door, as you can see in this reconstruction, it's usually higher than the roof pitch at the surrounding area to kind of maximize that light coming through. So that's your classic anatomy of a roundhouse. Um, you can see uh, a wonderful reconstruction here. Artist reconstructions like this one uh, quite often give us a bit more kind of complex detail. Again, this is a lot of interpretation built into it. This is not how we find it in the ground, but a lot of this is supportable. So you can see the entrance to the roundhouse. Uh, oh, sorry, forgive me. You can see the entrance to the roundhouse down here with the timber lintel. You can see a framework um, either side of the doorway. You come into the central space with a hearth, pot suspended over the hearth. It's got these internal subdivisions for sleeping spaces. And then this one has a upper floor, mostly for storage. Now, again, the roof pitch on a roundhouse has to be quite steep so that it sheds snow um, off the thatch or the turf of the roof. So actually, that gives you quite a lot of room for a loft conversion, as it were. Maybe not with the ensuite, but generally your loft conversion. So you can see what ours may have looked like in this and interestingly you can see the stone built wall but also a turf built upper see that in there this kind of herringbone turf pattern we'll come back to that a little bit later so this is the kind of possible kind of this is your this is your apex of a roundhouse this reconstruction this is what you want it to look like obviously it never looks like that in the ground and um, so to the ground i'm going to take you through the plans of our roundhouse over time as karen said we've dug this for three years this is the 2020 plan that you can see on your right um, with, again, if you're following my cursor, the roundhouse wall. It's got a shielding in the middle of it, which is a kind of later or an early modern or later historic um, pastoral you know, uh, itinerant structure um, for when you drive your sheet up into the, into the hills. 
and um, there's another ceiling down here at the bottom. So you can see the, the, the projection of the roundhouse wall, this is roundhouse 10, and then our 2020 trench. Um, I'm going to superimpose the trench boundaries from the last two years over this because we haven't got the um, plans digitized from the last two years yet. So apologies for that, but it will, should all become clear. So when we approached the site in 2020 um, and excavated it with this little L-shaped trench over three days, um, our roundhouse, roundhouse 10, gave us some of the classic things that we expected. It gave us a stone wall. Um, you can see it in the projection. We also found it in the trench with the tumble, the collapse either side of it. It gave us floor deposits. It gave us a kind of organic floor deposit over a little clay floor layer, which is probably a kind of waterproof sealant, essentially like a damp course uh, on the bottom of the floor. And then it gave us some features that we don't, don't usually expect for the roundhouse. So it gave us a destruction deposit across the whole of the interior of the roundhouse. So the roundhouse has been built, lived in, and at some point, either intentionally or unintentionally, burnt down. And this is the roof timbers going on fire, falling in, and then smoldering in situ. Um, and it also gave us a turf-built upper wall, not what you classically find, but if you think back to our reconstruction on the last slide, um, you get stone footing for the wall, a dry stone footing for the wall, and a turf upper. Um, so we found evidence of that. We've got the turfs. We're looking at them under the microscope um, at the moment to try and get a bit more information about the wider local environment, the paleo environment, that sort of stuff. Um, so this is what our 2020 excavation gave us. If we jump a year into the future, and excuse that I don't have a lovely plan for this. This dark black line is our trench boundaries from 2021. Um, you can see that superimposed over our 2020 trench, so a larger area. We were digging, I think, for four or five days in 2021. Um, and we were able to get into it, we told us a bit more detail. So this gave us more floors, and we've got a series of superimposed floors that are all kind of organic deposits, lenses of organic material. The floors generally in a roundhouse would be bracken or heather. And you would just drag it in, use it as the floor. It would rot down over a couple of years, and then you'd pull it out and spread it on the fields once it had become, once it had rotted down, basically. And um, it's actually that kind of cyclical floor use where you replace the floors every couple of years. We see in the medieval period, it's where the term spring cleaning comes from. After the winter, you pull the floors entirely out of the building and you put in new floors. Um, so we had some floors in 2021. We found the first evidence of our roof, other than that it was burnt down, with some internal posts. So you've got a ring of internal posts, you know, running like the, uh, yeah, essentially at the inside of the wall and um, supporting the roof at around its apex. And um, we found evidence of subdivisions running into the center of the roundhouse. So screens to divide bits of the roundhouse off from other areas. These are smaller post holes and stake holes in lines, probably supporting a kind of wattled. Um, kind of woven partition. And then we found things that we didn't expect. We had been looking in this little trench up here for the entrance in the southeast of the roundhouse, where it classically is. Um, Alison and John excavated that trench and didn't find anything other than the wall. Um, and then uh, Mark and Peter, but particularly Mark, who is here today, um, was excavating down in the west of the trench and identified the doorway in the west. Um, those of you who were at the lecture last year will have heard about the doorway, so I won't go into it in a lot of detail, but it is a big double post setting, you know, two big timber posts supporting a timber lintel that you enter through the, the into the roundhouse through. Um, and that looks straight west down the loch, basically a down pat, just across the roof of the museum and down the loch. So you can see the weather rolling up the loch towards you, which is always very nice and romantic. Um, so yes, we found our um, door in the west of the roundhouse down there. Maybe, maybe northwest. And then 2022. So this is our excavation from this year. You can see our trench boundary roughly this year in blue. And um, so it overlaps with both our 2020 and our 2021 trenches. And um, we had the privilege of excavating part of the um, late medieval or early historic uh, shielding. Um, we didn't actually find a lot in the shielding. I'll talk you through it in a minute. We didn't find a lot there other than the floors, but it's a nice shielding. Um, so we found our ceiling, which is there, and um, we got even more floors everywhere. Basically, there's floor, little lenses of flooring. Um, we got a lot more internal posts, again, in a kind of ring supporting the roof at its apex. We found um, 
the hearth, which I'll talk to you in more detail, was one of the things we wanted to hit. And again, one of those classic things you get in a roundhouse is a hearth. Um, we got a wonderful uh, complex of stake holes surrounding our hearth, which again, I'll show you in a minute, um, which were probably supporting uh, you know, a kind of metal or timber little A-frame that you can hang your pots over the fire on. So, because in the iron days they had these big iron cauldrons. So we've got the evidence of that. We've got an internal drain um, in the, uh, just running around the hearth essentially for any kind of surface water or anything that bubbles up through the floors, gets drained off through that drain. And incredibly, and I'll go into this in a lot more detail, we found what we think is a bread oven. Now that is not on our list of classic roundhouse features. In fact, we think that our bread oven is one of two in Scotland. Okay, so it's pretty rare to get a bread oven. And if you can see where we found it, just in this little extension of the trench, now that's only a meter wide. We were exceptionally lucky to hit it bang on in a meter because there was no real reason for us to dig that meter as opposed to any other meter. But we did it and we got the bread oven. It was fantastic. So we got our bre bread oven and enigmatically, we got a scattering of cremated bone across the floor deposits around the hearth. Now, that bone is currently with a colleague at the University of Edinburgh who's looking at it. Um, I'll go into the bone in a little bit more detail again later. I don't have any pictures of it because there's a the chance that it could be human remains. And there's a bunch of ethical concerns about displaying pictures of human remains. Um, but we do have a scattering of cremated bone across the middle of the site. So in 2022, we've ticked off a lot of the big things, a lot of the big classics that we want in a roundhouse, plus a couple of little extras, a little couple of little treasures, you know, the bread oven, the internal drain, the stake hole complex, the cremated bone, extra things that we didn't think we would get. Um, so that's fantastic news. And this all builds towards the argument that this is quite an important site just for us as archaeologists. Um, so if we look back at our artist's reconstruction, we've got almost all of the principal kind of classic architectural features. You know, we've got the floors, we've got the stone-based wall and the turf upper, we've got the roof supports, uh, we've got the hearth, we've got all that sort of stuff. But we've got other things that are not quite so classic. You'll notice that this artist reconstruction doesn't have a bread oven in it. We love a bread oven, we've got a bread oven. Um, it doesn't have internal drainage, we've got internal drainage. It's very sophisticated roundhouse on our one, it's very well plumbed. Um, and Gary, the plumber, will be very happy to hear that. Um, so there is um, aspects that are very classic and there's aspects that are less classic. Um, so I'm going to take you through some of our points of interest as we go through with some nice photos from this year's dig. Um, and starting right at the top is our sheiling. So you can see our sheiling here. Um, sheilings are associated with um, the agro-pastoral use of the uplands and the highlands in Scotland's later history. Um, they're classically a D-shaped kind of stone structure. So the flat side of the capital D is going down there, and then you got the bendy bit of the D coming back up this way. Um, our shieling has a very rough flagstone floor. I mean, it's kind of generous actually to call it flagstone. It's got a bunch of stones chucked in it, um, but it is a floor of smaller stones. Um, I was hoping on excavating it that we would find huge amounts of material because you know, the later you get in time, the more likely that your artifactual material is going to be preserved. And particularly in the 18th and 19th centuries, we should have bottle glass, we should have bits of ceramic, we should have pipe stems, we should have bits of iron objects, all that sort of stuff. We got nada out of this, um, off the floor of it, and we excavated half of it, um, which is kind of a shame, but in another way, it's quite an interesting story because it shows us that this sheiling was a particularly clean sheiling. Um, and every little piece of broken pottery was meticulously lifted out of it and there was nothing left for us to find. So this is our sheiling. You can see this is it when we removed the floor down onto a big kind of um, colluvial pad. So material that's washed down slope before the sheiling was built. Um, this is the kind of, yeah, that's the wall of our sheiling when the floor is removed. Interestingly, it did have a hint. This is looking the other way. So this is the wall of our sheiling. It did have a hint of... I mean, I'm asking you to kind of look at different colors of dirt here on a small photograph on your laptop screen, so it's not going to work. You're going to have to take my word for it. We think there may have been a, a turf built outside skin to it. If you think of it, you know, it's a single skin dry stone wall. The wind is going to howl through that. So one of the sensible things you would do is pile turfs up against the outside of it to give it a bit more insulation and stop the, the, the wind roaring, roaring through it. And we think we've got that in a spread of slightly lighter 
um, slightly more porous soil around it, which we think is the degraded turf. It could also be the turf roof of the shielding that's fallen off. Okay? So that's our shielding. It was not a treasure trove of fantastic artifacts, but it is a good shielding. Um, on to our bread oven, which is kind of the star of the show. I'll take you through this in a bit of detail. These are three photographs that are essentially time slices. So this is the bread oven as we first found it. And I will point out bits to you with the mouse. But again, you're looking at a small photograph on a laptop screen. So it's not going to be terribly easy. You'll just have to trust me and use the eye of faith. So this is when we first found it. This is it in the middle of excavation. And this is it just before we lifted it out of the ground. Um, this bread oven is made of fired earth. Quite a high clay component to it. We identified it in the field because basically the dirt was a different color dirt than the rest of the dirt that was in the trench. Um, fired earth usually undergoes a process called rubefaction, um, where a lot of the heavy metals, particularly the iron in the dirt, precipitate rapidly as it's heated, and you get a red staining, essentially a kind of a heat-induced iron panning within the soil. You can see areas of that reddening, that rubefaction, in here, all the way around here, all that orange stuff, and in here. Um, so that's how we first noticed it. Also, it was different in texture from some of the other soil. You can see it here in the middle of excavation. So we've taken a quarter slot out of it, taken all the stuff out that isn't oven fragments. So here is a fragment of oven wall. Here is a fragment. Here is a fragment. That's the base of the oven in there. Also interesting to note on this photo um, and, on, and on the next one, that our oven appears to have a flue at the back of it. So this is inside the roundhouse. The roundhouse wall is up here. Um, and this half section, so we've chopped half or taken half of the filling out of essentially a cut feature cut into the floor. We think that that is a flue for funneling air into the back of the oven to get it nice and hot. Okay, so we've got this little channel that they dug in the ground and that sits at the back of our oven and our oven is in here. And you can see that better. Here's where we've fully excavated other than a quarter that we block lifted for some scientific analyses. So you can see, again, these are those fragments of oven that have just been kind of kicked onto the floor. Here is the base of our, or the walls of our oven, just burnt clay, very poorly fired. So even if there was a flue, it wasn't doing a very good job of getting it very hot, because if it gets very hot, you get very hard fired ceramic, like the pottery. Um, this is exceptionally soft. It kind of had the consistency of tiramisu when we were excavating it. It was very, very soft. So this is the base of our bread oven, but it's been kicked about a bit, and it actually has a stone slab sitting at the bottom of it. And then this is the flue in there, which is again that channel I was speaking about. Um, and this is the section that we block lifted. So that's our bread oven. Um, I think I've got some more photos of it. So here's a bit closer shot of it. Again, this orangey darky bit is the oven. It's actually circular. It comes in here as well. This is again the quarter section that we've put in. So that those hard lines are arbitrary. That's not any archaeology. That's something we've done. And you can see in dimensions, it's very small. It is about 40 centimeters by 60 centimeters. And the way we were likening it, the thing we were likening, likening it to on site was, you know those posh little pizza ovens you get, the little uni posh metal pizza ovens that can do a single pizza at a time. This is the Iron Age equivalent of that. They're not making pizza, they're probably making bread, but it is that sort of thing. It's very, very small. It has a smaller capacity than your oven at home, so it is for a single loaf of bread at a time. Um, so again, this is the wall of it and the fragments that have been kicked off. And if you can see this gray material that it's sitting on and around it, that is all ash. So there's a lot of ash build up around it and internally in it as well, um, ash from its use. So it has not been cleared out after its last use, which is interesting. That tells us things about it. It tells us that they knew it was, well, I suppose, would, do you clear out your hearth after you have a fire or do you do it before you have the next fire? You probably do it before you have the next fire. So they used it, left all the ash in it and then didn't return, but they didn't clean it ceremonially like you would do if you were leaving an Airbnb, yeah? So that's our oven. Um, we took the oven off, um, or these three quarters of it, and it is currently sitting in a storage shed at the Airloft Museum um, in the hope that it will dry out slowly and we will be able to consolidate it 
and potentially display it if the museum want that. In taking it out, we took out this, we left a porter in to block sample. So we've taken that away, as I said, for scientific analyses. But we worked out that it's also sitting on this beautiful stone. So it's got a stone base, again, like a pizza oven. Okay. Um, and it's situated perfectly over that stone. So that stone that you can see there is the stone that's in the base of the oven there. And if you can see it in profile, and again, you're going to have to use the eye of faith here. This is the section that we cut through it. So that line there and this line there are the same. And you can see the reddened area over here. That's the wall of our oven. Now, obviously, for it to function as an oven, it must have had a top. That top's gone. Don't know where it is. It's been ripped off, kicked off, or collapsed. Um, but that is our bread oven. I'll talk you through what we're going to do with it as we move forward in terms of some of the scientific analyses. But that is our fantastic bread oven. And we can come back to that in a bit of detail later on. So our next point of interest is our hearth. Now, this is our hearth. Look at that. Right in the middle of the roundhouse. Big stonking stone. Little bit of fire damage on the side of it. Nowhere near as much fire damage, interestingly, as the roundhouse up the hill where you can open that if you've been to, to Gerlach and the, done, the, done the Jeremy's Fantastic Walk. Um, there's a roundhouse up the hill where there's a hatch over the hearth and you can lift it up and see the damage to it, the fire, and fire damage to it. This has not been used anywhere near so intensely. Um, but we think this is the hearth slab. One of the things that's telling us that it's a hard slab is the fantastic stakehold structure around it for holding up the frame that you hang your pots on. So again, we've got our hearth in here. It's probably, it probably was flat, bang on flat when they were using it. It's sunk because the middle of the roundhouse is a bit wet, so everything's sunk into the middle. Um, but it's got a series of little black circles. There's one there, there's one there, there's one here, there's one there, there's one there, there's one there. That is the A-frame structure supporting the pot that is hanging over the fire. Well, that's what it's most likely to be. Um, this is our this brown stuff is all of our roundhouse floor. So the highly organic material, the bracken that's been dragged in and out and in and out, it just leaves this kind of organic residue. It's quite thick. It's maybe about 10 centimeters of thickness. Um, and you can also see here, I'll just show you because it's a good photo of it, our lovely drain. So our drain starts here. These three stones go over it. So there's a little bridge over our drain. It's just a little cut into the floor and it comes through here. This is where Katie put a little slot through it for our drain. So it's only about 10 centimeters deep. It's essentially just to divert any kind of wetness seeping up through the floor away. It's not like a proper plumbed in kitchen. So it comes down here and then it drops off this way and goes outside the roundhouse. Um, uh, so this is our lovely hearth. Um, for our hearth, we have material from the top of it that is burned that we're going to get radiocarbon dates from. Uh, we've got, you know, samples from all the stake holes to, to again, hopefully get radiocarbon dates from, uh, get charcoal from that we can radiocarbon date, or even potentially more interesting, when we put those through the sieves, those samples from the stake holes, any little burnt cereal grains, any little bur burnt bits of barley that they've been cooking with on the fire, if any of them have fallen into those stake holes, we should get them out and we'll be able to tell a bit more about what people were eating. So that's our lovely hearth. Um, as I said, we've got a suite of post holes, and I wanted to highlight the very good work of um, John and Gary, who are both with us today. Um, this is up in the, the east of our roundhouse. So this is the roundhouse wall, the stone of the wall here. The brown stuff is our floor deposits. And Gary and John did a fantastic job on a series of post holes. So you can see one of them here, with these upright stones, it's the packing stones for the post. So when you dig a post hole, and you put a post, you dig a hole, you put the post in, and then you hammer big stone wedges in it, packing stones to prop it up, right? So we've got one in here that John dug, and then we've got a slightly more ephemeral complex one that Gary dug over here. Um, and you, these are the same ones, you can see them a bit more in plan. So this is John's lovely post hole. Again, you can see the packing stones of the post, and then Gary's is in here. Um, post holes, I mean, we've had post holes before. before. These ones are interesting because they're so close together. Um, if you're imagining standing in the center of our roundhouse, it's maybe nine meters across internally. The roof probably goes up to about five meters above you because of that pitch. So it's really, really high. Um, and there's loads of posts supporting the roof. If all the posts are very, very close together, it's quite hard to move through the center of your roundhouse. So when you see loads of posts close together, it's a bit of evidence that the roof has been replaced at some point, which is interesting because it also extends the lifetime of our roundhouse. We think generally, archaeologists think that a roundhouse can stand up for about 25 years. And after 25 years, 
the posts rot out at the base and the roof gets sugarly. But if you want to, you can, you know, and the roof's still intact, you can replace those posts. So you put an identical post next to it, you know, prop up the roof and then get rid of the rotten one. So that may be what we're seeing here. And it may extend the life cycle of our roundhouse beyond a generation to two. Um, so those are our wonderful post holes, well dug uh, by uh, John and Gary. Um, and then my last kind of point of interest that I'll go into is just the whole sequence. You know, we had a suite of ex excellent community excavators out with us, community archaeologists digging. We've been digging for three years now. We understand the site quite well. And here's one of our end of, uh, end of season photographs from this year. So this is us looking south. This is the hearth, the floor of the roundhouse, and like post holes all around it. There's our drain, our bread ovens over here. Um, we understand a lot about it. But we've been excavating it for three years. We've generated a lot of information. Um, and one of the interesting jobs that sadly our community archaeologists don't get to do, but I get to do in my evenings and weekends, is work out the full sequence. So we understand the sequence from this year. We understand what sits on top of what sits on top of what. But we need to marry that up with the sequence from the last two years to make sure that our interpretations from the last two years still stand or to challenge them and change them if they don't stand. You know, archaeology is a evolving process. And if you dig the same site over a number of years, every year you come up with interpretations. And then the next year, most of those goes in the bin because it doesn't make any sense anymore because the sequence has changed. So the whole sequence of this site is actually really interesting and really complex. And that will be further illuminated when we have our radiocarbon dates in because that will allow us to not just have a relative sequence of what sits on top of what sits on top of what, but what are specific dates, you know, for features in that period? Is it all crowded into a 50 year period, you know, or do we have reuse after a period of abandonment? Do we have it's in use for five years, five to 10 years, and then it's abandoned for a hundred years and then it's used again? We should be able to pick that out with radiocarbon dates. So that's our other point of interest is just the actual process of working out how we, working out what this means. What is the actual story of this roundhouse? Because every year it's different. And what I would say to any of you who are budding archeologists is we're always wrong and we can never know if we're right, right? Because we've dug this for three years. If we dug it just one year, we would have come up with a series of interpretations and put them out. And that would have been it. That would have been the story of the roundhouse. But then we came back the year after and we proved half of that stuff wrong. And then we came back this year and proved half of that other stuff wrong. Which means that actually, while we're not going to go back next year, if we were to, we'd probably prove a lot of our current interpretations wrong. So take everything I say with a pinch of salt. Okay. Um, so I'll run into our current interpretations because I do want to leave time for questions. Um, this site is fantastic. It is likely an Iron Age domestic roundhouse with well-preserved internal features. It is classic, an absolute classic, almost one for the purists, right? It is, it's got the wall, it's got the roof, it's got the floor, it's got the hearth, it's got everything we want it to do to say domestic roundhouse. The only thing that's stopping us saying it's definitely Iron Age, but it feels very Iron Age, is the absence of radiocarbon dates so far, but we're working on that. So it's a classic West Coast pretty well-preserved, pretty big Iron Age roundhouse. It contained some stuff that we expect, hearth, internal subdivisions, floor deposits, that sort of stuff, and some stuff that we didn't expect, the bread oven. You know? So while the bread oven doesn't make, it, doesn't make it a high status site, it doesn't mean it's where the chief lived, it makes it important to archaeologists because we don't have many of these bread ovens. And so it tells us more about the past and how people lived there, okay? And it allows us to ask a bunch more interesting questions. Um, it's got the stone wall and the turf, or the stone and the turf wall. That's nice to see, you know, there's an interesting narrative around turf use in Scotland just generally, but particularly in prehistory, which we're starting to draw out a bit more. Um, I've not told you anything about artifacts because actually they're really boring. Um, we've not got anything stunning, and I failed for the third year in the row to find Karen her loom weight, which is the one thing that she wanted. It's all she really wants from this process. Um, so we failed to do that. I hope the bread oven is close enough. Um, our artifactual assemblage is 99% stone tools. 
So we get a huge number of pot boilers, which are pot or stones heated in a fire, dropped into a pot of water to boil it, and then thrown away. We get loads of them, hundreds of them, hundreds of kilograms of them. Um, we have a suite of polishers, which are stones again that you are, you know, polishing textiles and hides, maybe burnishing pottery, that sort of stuff with just little beach pebbles that have got some scratches and wear on them from being used as polishers. We've got hammer stones, which are stones used as hammers. And we've got grinding stones, which are is evidence of cereal production. Um, they're using these stones to break up barley and things like that, barley and wheat uh, husks in the kind of uh, cereal production uh, process line. So we've got a few of them. Um, so yeah, as I said, 99% of our finds are stone tools. However, I mentioned earlier on our enigmatic little spread of cremated bone. So I'll go into that in a bit more detail. And note that I am leaving fact and going into interpretation and storytelling now. Okay, archaeologists should tell stories, um, but we should be very clear when we're leaving the facts behind. There's loads about these little fragments of bone that we don't know, but we will hopefully find a lot of it out. So across the floor of our roundhouse, we found 12 small fragments of cremated bone. None of the fragments is bigger than your pinky. So they're all very small and they're all white and they have a chalky texture. Now, bone, when it gets burnt, goes through a different series of stages in its, in its firing um, from very, very poorly fired up to very, very well fired. And it goes gray and it goes blue and it goes white. That chalky white color is right at the hot end. You need to be kind of maxing out a thousand degrees, maxing out 800 degrees to get to that point. Now you're not going to get to 800 degrees on an open fire in the middle of your own house. You're unlikely to get to 800 degrees in your wood burning, your posh new wood burning stove in your house now in Gearlock. So it's really quite hot. The way that you get to 800 degrees is either in a furnace that you are fueling with charcoal and you're pumping air into it, um, not like our bread oven, which bear, bear in mind is not well fired, or you get it on a pyre. You get it if you are cremating a body. Um, and you get there by burning the body for about five days and feeding it intensively. Okay? So our cremated bone has gone through one of those two processes. It's either been on a pyre or it's been used in a furnace, potentially as a kind of catalyst for some of the metalworking procedures. Now, I can't say which one it is. A specialist at Edinburgh is looking at the bone currently um, and will hopefully tell us more about it, ideally um, what species it is and the firing temperature it reached. Um, there is a chance that it is human bone, which is why I've not put any photos of it on, because there's, as I said, there's ethical concerns about that. Um, but if it is human bone, it tells us another interesting story, okay? We know that our roundhouse had a timber roof, which was burnt down. Now, jury's kind of out on whether that, burnt, whether that roof was burnt down accidentally while people were still living there, or intentionally at the end of the roundhouse's life. Across the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, you have a lot of closing events. We see them at roundhouses, we see them at hill forts, we see them at all sorts of things. And they generally involve torching the place down. There is a chance that when people left this roundhouse, they pulled the roof in and set it on fire and all sat around and watched it burn. Um, another thing you classically get in closed roundhouses is deposits of human remains. Now they are mostly in the form, overwhelmingly in the form of inhumations, burials of human remains, not scatterings of cremated material. There is not a lot of precedent for the scattering of cremated human remains across the floor of a site before you close it. But that could be a potential interpretation for what we have in terms of that. Um, another thing that's maybe ticking the site has been closed box for me, rather than it's burnt down accidentally, is that lack of high value artifacts. You would have thought that if the site has burnt down, if the house has burnt down while you're still living in it, all of your good stuff's in it. Yeah. And while you probably dig through the remains to get your best stuff out, like your iron cauldron and things like that, you probably don't manage to get everything because you're digging through the burned remains of your house. Because we're just getting stone tools, which are not high value items, that maybe suggests that the house was cleaned of its high value artifacts before it was abandoned which is another potential tick in the box, as I said, for that closing. So 
that's our current interpretation of how the site met its end. Now that might all change in time. There's loads of things that could change. We're going to do a lot of scientific analysis, radiocarbon dates, look at the bone, all that sort of stuff that will tell us a bit more. But that's our current interpretation as it stands. And I know it's a bit flashy and I know it's a bit cool and it's, you know, flashy, cool things are often wrong, but hey, let's have fun and do some storytelling. And if it's wrong, then we'll write a paper that says it's wrong and you can tease me about it. Um, the next steps are the classic next steps for us um, in terms of finishing excavation. So we will not be returning to Roundhouse 10. We've done as much as we can of it. Um, we, will, we obviously haven't dug it in its entirety because it is good to not fully excavate sites because somebody may come along in 50 years or 100 years with better kit and more money and do it better. And it's good to allow them intact deposits so that they can reinterpret what we've done. Yeah. Um, but we're not going to be coming back to round test 10. The next steps are we need to digitize all of our drawings. And we've got an illustrator set up to do that. Um, we're going to finalize and open access, publish our DSR, which is data structure report. Basically, it's the kind of massed technical findings of what we worked out. It's not an easy read, right? It'll be a couple of hundred pages long. It'll be super boring. But it's basically, we found this post hole and it was this wide and this deep and it had this sort of dirt in it. We found this other post hole and it was this wide and this deep and it had this different type of dirt in it, right? So it's super boring. We'll get that out. We'll then complete our post excavation work. So that's finds analysis. We'll get some of the finds illustrated as well. Soil analyses, I'll be doing that. Uh, charcoal analyses, so we'll work out the species of all of the charcoal, see what's growing in the wider area, see what they're burning, how are they selecting fuels, that sort of stuff. We will get some of that charcoal radiocarbon dated to get specific dates for specific features in the site to allow us to create a better kind of chronology of the site. And we'll get that bone looked at and work out, is it human or animal? What species is it? How well has it been fired? We will then draw all that together and publish a full report, um, which may, which will probably be a peer reviewed publication now, but we'll find a way of making it open access so that everybody can get a look at it, because it's important that everybody has a look at it. And then we will organize the archival um, aspects and potentially create some exhibition material for the Gearlock Museum if Karen wants it. Um, obviously, a collection of funny shaped stones is not terribly interesting, but we'll see what we can do. So those are our next steps with Roundhouse 10. Um, so to conclude, and then we'll go on to questions, um, Roundhouse 10 is important. It's, it's a solid site. It conforms with what we expect, but it's got rare features that need further research that tell us more, that add value to it as a site. It is not an except, it would not have been an exceptional site for the people living in there. It would have been a bog standard house and most people would have had a house like that. So it's not the chief's house. It's not our pyramids of Giza where crazy people are buried. It is a bog standard house, but for archeologists, it has a huge amount of value, more so than most roundhouses on the West Coast because it has the potential to tell us a lot more because it's so well preserved, because it's got interesting features and because we've dug it well, okay? So it's a really important site. Um, the digging is done, the post excavation work continues and will hopefully allow us to answer some of these questions and ask new ones. Um, and the Gearlock Museum and the archeologists, so me, Katie Walker and Mary Davis, are keen to keep digging. Um, and so seem to be our gluttons for punishment, our fantastic community archaeologists. So, and this is something we could discuss in conversation now if people wanted to, um, what do the community want to dig next? We've done Roundhouse 10. What do you want to do? We can do kind of whatever you want as long as we can get landowner permission to do it. So you let us know what you want to do. Um, that's me. Thank you all for listening. Thank you very much to the Gearlock Estate, specifically for the permission to excavate. Very, very generous of them. We do appreciate it, and we're sorry that the site's so muddy now, but I'm sure it will all look good in a year. Um, so I will happily take any questions from now. Sorry, I was just... <laughs> trying to find the unmute button um that's a fantastic picture you ended on there tom very nice i have 
obviously heard most of this story as the excavation was um, was ongoing, but I still find it fascinating to sit and listen to. So thank you very much for that. And I'm sure there are questions. I have one or two, but there's one in the chat. Um, first of all, if I could start with that one. So um, Di Davies would like to know what the time period is that's covered when we talk about the Iron Age in Northern Scotland. Of course. So the Iron Age across Britain generally starts about 800 BC, so 2,800 years ago, and ends whenever the Romans show up, if they show up, right? So we've got the Iron Age, and then we have this little thing called the Roman Iron Age. Now, obviously, the Romans don't show up at the same place at the same time, so they show up in the south of England first, and then they make their way north. So the end of the Iron Age is actually staggered, depending upon where you are, okay? Now, we say Iron Age, and we put years on it, we put dates. That is just a method that we as archaeologists use to curtail time so that we can talk about it in discrete blocks. Actually, somebody's life, you know, 801 BC, when you clock ticks over to 800 BC, their life does not change. It does not change demonstrably. Um, iron is... Iron working is discovered, they start doing it, but like all things, like all new technologies, it starts off very slowly and it starts off in the hands of the rich. So people living in a roundhouse like ours are not suddenly going and driving lovely iron carts everywhere. They don't get iron for a very long time. So the Iron Age starts about 800 BC. In the north of Scotland, the Romans actually don't show up, or they don't show up in a way that they do in the rest of Scotland. They don't come and build forts and you've got Italian people walking around looking very tanned, eating olives, drinking wine, speaking in interesting languages, right? That's not happening. We know that the Romans circumnavigate mainland Scotland, so they sail around it, so people will have seen Roman boats move around, and they probably also send emissaries up to bribe people to keep them sweet. So we start to see Roman artifacts, glass, pottery, silver, you know, we see amphora, they're clearly bringing wine up the coast, all that sort of stuff. So we see that happen, but we don't necessarily have a Roman person sitting and living in this roundhouse, okay? Um, so in terms of when the Iron Age ends, in the west, on the northwest of Scotland, it's kind of hard to tell. We generally say it ends at the start of the early medieval period, which is around about 600 AD, when the Picts come across and the Scots come up and all sorts of stuff like that. But it gets a bit muddy about when it actually ends. But the important thing to bear in mind is that Iron Age is just a term that we've made up to, to slot into some years, okay? It doesn't actually mean a lot for people's everyday lives. I hope that answers the question. I don't think it does, but there we go. Okay. <laughs> That was a, 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 a quite a long answer to, I bet I just thought he was going to get some dates. <laughs> Thank you. There's another question here from Jackie in Aberdeen, and she'd like to know, no pressure, but uh, when are the radiocarbon dating results likely to be available? Well, um, Karen and I need to sit down and write a funding application. Ah. Um, which will be very fun that winter is work for us. Um, at that point, when the funding comes through, and it, you know, there's loads of places we can apply to, and we're confident getting funding. I won't worry about that. We, I would be surprised if we didn't have radiocarbon dates this time next year. Okay. Actually, getting them through the lab, we probably use Suwerk and East Kilbride. Um, doesn't take very long. You know, they can get it through in a couple of weeks. So once we get the funding, we can kind of press go on that. The thing that needs to happen before the radiocarbon date, though, is we need to get all the charcoal ID'd for the species. Because you're, when you're radiocarbon dating a piece of charcoal or a piece of carbon-rich material, if it's bone or whatever it is, um, you are actually dating the carbon or the point that the carbon was absorbed by the living thing, be it a person or an animal or a tree. Um, some trees can live for a thousand years and then so the tree lives for a thousand years is cut down and then burned so you think you're dating the time that the tree was burnt which is the date of your hearth and the date of your people living in the roundhouse but if the tree has lived for a thousand years then you're not dating that and your roundhouse will be a thousand years earlier in the date than it actually is so 
we want to date species that are short lived. Think trees that don't live very long and ideally parts of trees that only grow in a year or parts of plants or animals that only grow in a year. So things like hazelnut shells, cereal grains, very small twigs that have been intaking carbon for a very short period of time and then have immediately fallen off the tree. So again, a long answer to a short question, um, but hopefully this time next year. Great. Uh, I have a question that yeah. also about the results. So I'm really interested to find out what was in the oven, in that bit in the middle, yeah. um, uh, on top of the stone. And I'm just wondering how will that be analyzed? Do you dissolve and kind of sieve out bits or, um, yeah, what, what's the process? Great question for me to be, get a bit nerdy about. So um, buckle in everybody, <laughs> it's like take five minutes. Um, so uh, we sampled all the material from the middle of the oven. So we've got it all in bags and um, we can, um, we will put that through a series of sieves to get out any organic matter that is in it. Things like you know, big stuff like cereal grains. So if there's any burnt cereal grains in it, we'll get them out of it. Don't worry about that. The vast majority of what is in it looks like it's just ash. And it's not actually ash because it's been wet for so long. It's just the silica shells of the ash. All the 95% of ash is uh, degradable in water. It dissolves. So when it gets buried in the ground, your big pile of ash becomes a very, very small band of ash, which is just the, the silica bits of the plant that are left. Everything else is gone. Um, it seems like it's full of ash. We will look at it under a microscope. We've taken a section um, through it that we are going to chop up, set in resin, chop into a very thin slice and look at it under a microscope. Um, I will be doing that here based in my study on my microscope. Um, and that will let us know what the contents of the oven are. Again, it is likely to just be ash, but it will show us if there's different bands of ash, you know, different species that are being used, if there's different, if there's several, if you, if you can imagine your wood burning stove, as long as you don't stir the ash around at the bottom of it, I could come and take a slide from that and work out how many times you, how many times you'd use that oven since you last cleaned it out. Yeah, so we could maybe do the same thing with this. Obviously, the quality of the information will degrade because we're two thousand years in the past, so it's not quite as easy as going into your hearth now. But we would hopefully be able to get that sort of level of information out of it. What it will also let us do is have a look at what the oven wall is made of because we've got a bit of that in our section as well so we'll be able to get that under a microscope and see what sort of soil is it how clay is it how highly has it been burnt has it had anything mixed into it you know if you build a an earthen oven now or if you build something in cob or rammed earth there are recipes for the earth you know if you're building something wet like a cob you put straw in it so we'll be able to see if they mixed straw into this thing before they coiled it up into their oven. If it's coil built, we'll probably be able to see the coils, um, you know, like, like a coil built pot. So there's loads of bits of information that we can gain out of it. Um, and we've got all the samples to be able to do it. It's just a question of how soon I can get right into it. Um, the samples need to be sent off to Paris to be made and things like that. So it'll take a little bit of time. Um, but yeah, we should be able to learn a lot. And it's worth noting that People are interested in your bread oven. The people I've spoken to, Tanya Mankovitz at the University of Edinburgh, Fraser Hunter at the National Museum of Scotland, Lindsay Butzer, who's at Cardiff now. These are all Iron Age, Scottish Iron Age specialists. We don't have many of these bread ovens in a house. We've got, well, we've got two, and this is one of them, okay? So they are excited by it. It gives us the potential for a lot of interesting information about how people lived in their houses and what their day-to-day -day life looked like. And that is, most of the job of archaeology. You would think looking at the History Channel, most of the job of, of our archaeologists is to tell conspiracy theories and dig incredible tombs for gold stuff. That's not what we do. Those are bad archaeologists. Archaeology is about learning about what people's lives were like. People like me and you, not the rich people, not the 1%, the vast majority of people. And those people had bread ovens. They didn't have golden chariots, okay? So, sorry, I've turned this into a socialist rant, Karen, but we will be able to learn quite a lot about the people who lived in this roundhouse and what they were doing with that oven. That's fantastic. And as a social history museum, we, of course, entirely agree with you. There we go. And 
um, yeah, I think it's just it's fantastic that the the journey of discovery is by no means finished when once you finish digging and, and backfilled the site. There's still so much to learn, um, as you say, by how people were living. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have another mess, um, question in the chat, but does anybody want to actually ask the question? Can I ask Tom a question, please? Yeah, sure, Hi, um, that was a fabulous talk, Tom. Thank you very much indeed. Can I ask you about the role or place of bread in an Iron Age diet? You said that there were just a couple of uh, bread ovens that have been found, none in the ones round about. So was bread something of a luxury item for people or was it something that people in general didn't want to eat? Where did bread fit into everything that people were eating in the Iron Age in west of Scotland? That's great, thank you, Alan. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. So we get a lot of corn drying kilns. So they're drying cereals. They're, they're growing a lot of cereals, they're probably feeding a lot of it to their animals. Um, they're drying a lot of cereals, they're probably using a lot of that in brewing. They're making beer and light beer and things like that. So we know they're doing a lot of cereal production. We don't see a lot of bread ovens in domestic settings. When the Romans show up, especially because they show up mostly with their armies, they build massive bread ovens, which are for making thousands of loaves of bread a day for legionaries and auxiliary troops. So they have massive brick-built bread ovens in the south of Scotland and, and in England. Um, we don't get that on the west coast of Scotland because there's fewer people and it's not quite as organised. Um, I also think... If you look at a lot of traditional bread recipes from across the world, I think in places like India and things like that, actually not many of them are done in a purpose-built oven. Loads of them are done on hot rocks by the fire. So it's kind of flat bread style stuff. So we know that they're grinding their cereals down because we've got the grinding stones and we've got querns from the area and things like that. So we know they're growing cereals. We know they're processing them into flour. But what we don't see a lot of is the bread side of it. Probably because, as I said, most of it is actually being done by the fire or it's being done on iron griddles. It's not being done in an oven. Um, so I suppose it's it, about what your definition of bread is. You know, a, a risen loaf in an oven is bread, but so is a flatbread done by a fire. And they're mostly doing the latter, not the former. Now, does that make it a luxury? I don't know. I think we're outside of my realm of experience um, and, and expertise on this, um, but I would argue that nothing in this house suggests that these people were higher status than anybody else. So if they're having bread baked in an oven, I think most people are probably having bread baked in an oven. It's just that we haven't found the ovens because they might not be in the house. This might be just the house one and all the other ones have them outside and that might just be a point of personal preference for the people living in this house or no or they weren't lucky enough to dig in the right meter well that's very true the other thing to bear in mind is that this bread oven is not very big and not very good it's very poorly fired if it had been used 50 times you would expect it to be a lot better fired than what it is so then there might be characteristics about the soil that they've built it out of that maybe suggest it doesn't it's not pure clay so it doesn't fire like a you know clay built oven wood and things like that we we'll work all that out but if they're making bread in the house in this oven if it's a bread oven they're not doing it very much and um, it may be happening very occasionally or i mean we think that the roof burnt down <laughs> one possible interpretation is that they the reason you don't find bread ovens in houses in the Iron Age is because they burn the roof down. And that's exactly what's happened here. And the first time they fire up their lovely new bread oven, the roof comes down. And that's it. So that's a great story. <laughs> um, Jackie is asking just briefly whether the interest in the oven that you mentioned uh, might give us a better chance of funding for um, our research. People will be in, people are interested in it. Um, what archaeologists are interested in and what funders want to fund are often diametrically opposed uh, things. Um, but we can see what we can do. Um, what, what would probably be the, if you were going to game it, what would probably be the best 
way of thinking about it is what do we need to finish up our report? It's mostly just radiocarbonates. So we deal with that just me and Karen and we go and we get the money and we get the radiocarbonates. And then I can do the soil analysis, but we get the oven essentially as a concept and we give it to a researcher who's more specialized in that field. And then they do all the legwork, they go and they get the money, they use our results and they publish it. But we don't have to try and convince the Arts and Humanities Research Council that this bread oven warrants half a million pound. You know what I mean? So it, it helps in some ways because it's an interesting story. But to be honest, the thing that community thing that the research councils are going to want to fund or funders are going to want to fund generally is not actually anything about the archaeology. It's the fact that we've got a bunch of people from the local community who are interested and want to dig stuff. Like that community empowerment and community activity and engagement with a subject and you know social interaction and soft skills and all that sort of stuff. That's what people want to fund. They don't want to fund one quite interesting old bread oven. So if we're well, going to it a particular way, we'd do it that way. We maybe ask Harry Gow whether he'd like to um, sponsor our research. It could be where the first dream ring came from. Yeah. But just going back to what you're saying about community archaeology, Fiona's asking a question about um, when we do hopefully return to some more digging, whether we have a site in mind that we might tackle next. She wonders, uh, same time period or on a different location? Um, and she said, thanks for the talk. Fantastic. Thank you, Fiona. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of... As I said, it, it, it depends upon two factors. One is what the local community and the museum want to do. You know, I am happy to keep doing this, it's fun. Um, I work in, you know, from a desk now, so I don't get to dig much. So this is my holidays and I appreciate that. And I appreciate the opportunity to come and work with you all. Um, yeah, one of the factors is what do the local community want to do? I mean, we dug an Iron Age roundhouse because it was close to the museum and it was nice to go in and if it gets too wet and have a cup of tea. Um, and it has proven to be really, really good um, and really interesting archaeology. You know, I'm, a, I'm not really a period specialist, but I do prefer prehistoric stuff, so it works for me. But if you want to go and survey, you know, 18th century fishing stations, we can do that. If you want to go dig shielings, we can do that. You know, if we can do whatever you want to do. The other thing that it's dependent on is landowner permission. Um, loads of the uh, land around Gerlach is owned by the Mackenzies of Gerlach. So if you know them well, it might be worth buttering them up and telling them how important uh, it is that people keep digging on their estate, because um, we do it all at their, uh, in, in their goodwill. Um, there are 10 roundhouses at After Care. If you want to keep digging roundhouses, you can keep digging roundhouses. There's a really big one at the top. I can't remember what the number is that Jeremy's given it, but it's massive. And most of you who live there will know which one I'm talking about. Now, there's a discussion as whether that's a roundhouse or not. Is it a big stone circle gathering place with no roof on it, or is it the big chief's house? We could go and find that out if you wanted to. We could dig that, and we wouldn't need a huge amount of money to do it. We could do it the way we've been doing it currently. There are other things that we could do where we would probably want a bit more of a plan and a bit more money because they could get risky. What I mean by that is, you know, there are burials, there are cairns, chambered cairns, all that sort of stuff. If we wanted to dig human remains, there are certain ethical concerns and considerations around it, whether it's the right thing to do, whether the site needs to be dug, what do we get out of it? You know, what does the archaeological record get out of it? And we would want to maybe have a bit more contingency cash in case we came across anything that needed specialist conservation. You know, one of the great benefits of digging a roundhouse is that you get stone tools. Stone tools don't need specialist conservation. You wash them with a toothbrush and you put them in a box and that's it. If we were to dig a burial ground or a chamber of care or something like that, we might get human remains. We might get metal work. We might get textiles. We might get ceramics. We might get glass. We might get all that sort of stuff that needs specialist conservation work. Because to do it without specialist conservation work is grave robbing because the stuff will just get destroyed. Um, so for us to do something like that, it would be great. It would be interesting. I'm happy to do it. We would need to have a bit of a plan and maybe some money first to do that. Mm. But the question is over to all of you as to what do you want to dig? 
we can we can kind of do anything with those caveats I've just put in place. Yeah. Answers on a postcard to the museum. Yeah. So we talk, we did talk a little bit about setting up a group um, mm. and next year, a new year, to maybe have a think about this and do some planning for the next dig. Hopefully, Tom will have finished his DIY and his new house by by next autumn. So so he'll have some holidays to uh, I can see Sally shaking her head. Yeah, my fiance is <laughs> disagreeing with that one. <laughs> but hopefully he'll still have some holidays to spend on, yeah. on digging. Yeah. So uh, I think it's just um, about half past, but if there's if anyone else with a burning question, speak now. No, okay. So I think you're off the hook, Tom. But thank you so much for um, coming back and talking to us this evening. Uh, so I can see lots of rounds of applauses and, and comments in the chat about how much people have enjoyed it. And um, we do hope to see you again before too long in, in Gerloch. Thanks to everyone of you who's come along this evening. We really appreciate you spending your time with us and also those of you who made donations with your tickets as well. It allows us to, to do other things like this. So thank you very much for that. You were taking a break from talks in December. Emma will correct me if I'm wrong. We are, we've still got our Kaylee nights running on a Monday night and our warm winter Wednesdays. If you're in Gerloch, come and join us. And we're open Thursday, Friday, Saturday until the week before Christmas. And we'll be back in the new year with more um, winter talks, which will either be on uh, Zoom or hopefully a uh, hybrid. So, so that those of you who are not in Gerloch will be able to join us. So thanks again to everyone. Big round of applause. Um, for, for Tom. Enjoy the rest of your evening and see you in the new year, if not before. Wonderful. Thank you all. Cheerio. Bye. Bye.